So today I'm going to try a really fun and simple experiment. I'm going to lay down on the sidewalk and try and fall asleep and then I'm going to suddenly get up and start running while I've got my electrodes ECG connected to my heart monitor recording the data and I also got the camera and my eyeglasses recording the video and we'll be able to see and understand the relationship between what's happening around me and what my heart's doing, what's happening in the body and around the body. So get this sudden up chirp effect and we'll be able to apply the chirplet transform to analyze that data. So it'll start out kind of slow, it's going to sound like and go higher in pitch. So let's get started. So there's five steps to doing a good electrocardiogram. The first step is to shave. Start with a beard trimmer first, if it's long, and then a regular shaver. The second step is to shower, body scrub. The third step is sand, sandpaper. There's something nice, like a nice fine sandpaper even works pretty good. There's a couple of different grit numbers here. Sandpaper. And the third step is isopropyl alcohol. And the fifth step is the electrodes themselves. And then of course you put on the heart monitor after that. If you shave regularly, you probably don't need the uh, beard trimmer. Sometimes I reference over on the left leg, right arm, left arm area, and then of course the fourth and fifth intercostal regions. A little bit of sandpaper in this. This here is a number uh, 320. I think that'll be about right. One spot is here. The other spot is right up here. I've just put a little mark there roughly where the spot's going to be. and the date and time are there. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the magic button on here and the lights will come on and we'll know when that is. So now I've got it in the pipe and I'm going to tighten the pipe fitting. Keep the water out. So then my heart monitor is inside this pipe and if I've got the heart monitor in the pipe, the pipe can keep water in. It can also probably keep water out. It'll run and swim with this thing on. That's pipe fittings attached to me. And then I've got these four wires here that say R. It goes here, driven right leg. And, and uh, G will be the other side and one and two. And G will be here. And then it doesn't matter what one and two are, but I'll usually just conventionally consider one to be the positive lead, which would be over here on this side. So this is one right here. I'm going to call this one. And so now I've got here, there's a clock there on the screen, yeah. and uh, I, I'll push F12 to get it to full screen, yeah. okay. and then I can put that down here so I can see that clock, and then this clock, I guess if we just lean that yeah. up here like this, it'll be, oh, that's, and then i got to get my screwdriver. Yeah, well, at least not with the, the Android. 
for huh. huh. That's funny because a clock should be able to be a clock, you know. Yeah, you can always download an app for that. It's just a question of how easy these things are. Yeah. Whether it's super display easy. Time. No, no, they have a setting that basically says display time for a second. Oh, yeah. Oh, there, oh, there it is. Okay, that's good. So now we can see what time it is according to these clocks. So that's 31, 32. Yeah, so they're pretty close. Those two clocks are are, are pretty close. And then I'll undo this pipe here. Open up this uh, this pipe here. It's it's flashing, so I can see here the clock yep. and that clock over there. And then if I push it somehow so that I can see it, because that'll stop it. Yep. And then So we're going to look at some uh, of this ECG data here and uh, data that we collected last day. And um, so I've written a short little Octave script. So we're using a program called Octave. And this is the script that reads the data. So it uh, takes in this data EXG15 from Wednesday, March 10th, run swim, uh, where I was laying down. Uh, and then I suddenly got up and started running. Uh, I read the data. Now when I put those ECG electrodes on, there's a certain time I started the data recorder and then put the electrodes on, so there's a lot of noise in the data. So uh, for channel 1, the first 66,019 points are bad or garbage, and 66,020 is when I connected the uh, left electrode. and the right electrode I connected that at the seven the first seven seven three eight nine data points are bad so seventy thousand three hundred and ninety onward samples are good so because uh, one of the channels is bad from this point uh, we're gonna start the data record when both channels are good so that they're in line so um, that's a loss of about, well, less than 3.6% of the data is bad at the beginning when I put the, turn the apparatus on and then put the electrodes on. So there's approximately, uh, um, you know, this about 1.8 million samples of good data. Uh, the swim was around the millionth sample of the good data. These are just comments. When you start something with a percent sign, that's just a comment in the file. So what I do is I go F equals F open in quotes, ECG data, uh, what the file name, and then it'll return me a file handle, which is just an, a number, an integer. You know, it starts at 3, and uh, when I ran it, F was equal to 19 or whatever, some number, depending on how many times you've opened a file. Uh, a is F read, that's a formatted read of F, the file handle, so that's just the number. So if F, F open here returns a number like 19, and you go A equals F read of bracket 19 comma quote UCAR unquote unbracket. Uh, it will return uh, the data uh, into A, into, into an array A, or data, you know, data element A. And the semicolon at the end just stops it from printing so it doesn't show up on your screen. And then we reshape that data to A comma 16 and length of A over 16. So it reads in as a one-dimensional array, but I really want to understand it as a two-dimensional array, so I'm reshaping it as a 2D array. <clears throat> and this uh, <coughs> channel 1 is 256 cubed times B, uh, you know, the fourth column, plus 256 squared times the third column, plus 256 raised to the 1, which is just 256, 
times the second column plus 256 raised to the zero, which is just one times the first column. And that's just the order the data comes in. Channel two uh, is likewise the eighth, seventh, sixth, and fifth columns. So columns one, these are byte columns, you know, one through four are the bytes of the uh, channel one, and columns five through eight are the bytes of channel two, and the ordering in terms of the significance is that the higher columns are more significant. <laughs> and so this is just giving us channel one and two. And our ECG signal, which I'm taking, is channel one minus channel two. And we saw earlier the electrode placement. Uh, there's a picture there that shows where the electrodes are placed. Uh, and one of them is a little bit, uh, you know, to the to the left here, and the other one is up and to the right. And those placements were advised by my doctor, actually gave me a recommendation in a video call of exactly where to place the electrodes to get the most meaningful electrocardiographic signal. Not necessarily the strongest signal, but the most clinically relevant signal. So now we're going to remove uh, not the first 66,019 data points of garbage, but we're actually going to remove the first 70,389 points of garbage because we want to remove the garbage from both. We want to start the data record at the time when both channels are good. So channel 1 is equal to channel 1 of S. This is the start index, 70,390 to length of channel 1, semicolon so it doesn't print. And then channel 2 is equal to, to channel 2 of S to length of C2. And then now I'm taking the electrocardiographic information. E is C1 minus C2. CLF clears the figure. It used to be CLG, but CLG is no longer used as a command. So now in modern day, the command is CLF to clear the figure. Now, what I noticed is that 200,000 data points is about the most you can plot in a graph and still see a recognizable electrocardiographic waveform, you know, and have it still look like an ECG waveform where you can see the little spikes in the waveform. So I prefer not to sort of to plot a graph of only, you know, 200,000 points. And it so happens that we've got about a little over 1.8 million points. So that gives us, if we do subplots, we can do, you know, nine rows of data and still see each of the ECG waveforms quite clearly. So this will plot out nine rows of 200,000 200, records in each row. So now the command to use, and I'm in this directory, I'm in a directory swim op 2021 March 10th. I call these swim ops. A swim op is a OP stands for Ontario Place, so swim at Ontario Place. That's where I like to run to swim at the beach there. So usually I have my data records. This is my daily exercise routine, and I try to get out for my daily exercise for health and so it consists of a run and a swim so in this case I'm laying down and then I get up and run really hard and then swim hard and then come back fairly slow and easy so it'll be a hard run to the beach a fairly hard swim and then an easy trip back so the heart rate will be less going back uh, after the swim <clears throat> and then now if you look at the data if we go octave and usually I don't like the GUI. I'm not a big fan of GUI, dash, dash, no GUI. And then we can go ECG, read data, and it'll come in and it'll create a plot here. And then if we wish, we can take that plot here and uh, we can take that plot and enlarge it here a little bit. And sometimes uh, if I run it again, uh, when I'm, it'll run it nicer in terms of reshaping. So now I can see the data here very, very clearly. I can see this is when I'm sort of laying down, relaxing, and then I get up and I run hard. You'll see uh, when I stretch out that data and look at it more closely, you can see that it is starting out slow and speeding up. And then you can see it here and then this is where the swim occurs right here you can see that jump the swim goes here and then you can see that crumb the data is kind of crummier or noisier when i'm going the swim because the water affects the electrodes and then you continue over here one way i find it's nice to be able to the human ear is very attuned to frequency and sound and audio so one thing i can do is i can play back that 
uh, record and we can listen to that whole record to understand what it sounds like. So if I look at, uh, in, in, when you're inside Octave you can type, uh, I, I made a, a, I wrote a little uh, script here that uh, is uh, E here and uh, I had it originally as a function but I commented out the function because Octave uh, interrupts it, it gives a warning and exits. So ES is the um, variable that we assume that E in, so ES is the variable, the scaled version of E. E is the ECG data and ES is scaled, so I've gone ES equals ES minus the minimum value and ES equals ES over max, so that goes from 0 to 1 on the interval and then I've just doubled it and subtracted 1 to make it go from minus 1 to 1, which is the, the range of which the audio player plays best. So you can see when we play a sound, we want to play it uh, with with the uh, on the interval from minus one to one. So just to understand how this audio scaling works, let's say um, I'll, I'll make some variable like I'll say a time axis time equals uh, zero to forty four one hundred minus one over 44 100 so that's just a time index from 0 to 1 second so let's say I'm gonna let y equal cos 2 pi times a thousand t and then we're gonna go this gonna listen to that sound and you can see that's just a cos wave and then it'll stop I'm at about a quarter of the of the sample rate. Now if I control Z out of that uh, I can I'll VI this file here. I had this set to reduce sampling rate so I'll go let me go back to the normal sampling rate 4410. I had it set to a quarter of the sampling rate and then so there's a thousand cycles per second tone and you can see just I want to give you an idea of what happens if it's out of range so if I go if I'll just go here player equals audio player and then I'll play player that's basically what it's doing now my sound levels pretty normal. If I play that louder or stronger, like if I go y equals 10 times y, say that's stronger, and then I'll go player ES equals y and play that. You can see it doesn't sound at all like a 1,000 cycles sound sine wave. It's much distorted because it's clipping. It's too strong. So um, if you plot that waveform, of course you can. There it is, right there. I'll go CLF to clear it because it's in the last subplot of the ten, of the nine plots, and then I'm going to go plot Y again. And so there it is, it goes from minus 10 to plus 10, and it's just simply too strong of an amplitude. So that's why we need to scale it. So that's why that, that little script I wrote scales the function. So now uh, if I go yes equals y, and then it sounds normal again because I've scaled it properly. So now let's go yes equals E, the EC, this is the ECG waveform, and let's listen to that.
So that's about two hours. That data record is about two hours, one minute and two seconds long. So let me just come back inside here because I think we can hear it a little bit better inside. This is a little less traffic noise. We'll listen to that again. That's the swim. You can hear the noise there. And so you can hear at the beginning, at least, very distinctly, the part of it that's laying down and then speeding up. So let's just listen to the first little bit. Say one to 200,000 points. And uh, so that's not the part that chirped. So let's say 200,000 to 400,000. So that is the part with the chirp in it. Let's narrow that interval down a little bit. So that's the part that has the chirp in it. And we can we can try to isolate or identify the part that has that chirpiness in it when I suddenly got up. Let's try 25. Not quite. So 25,000 to 28,000 or something. So that's got the chirp in it right there, maybe 20. So you can hear clearly that's the part of the signal that has the chirp in it. We can try to narrow that down a little bit. Um, maybe. And so that's rough, roughly the part that has the chirp in it. And so we can identify or isolate the part that has the chirp in it. And then we can try and, and plot that. So uh, just to make the numbers nice, let's say um, uh, I'll make this... 25,000, 24,501. And then now let's plot ES. And we can see, we can distinctly see that chirp there. And maybe what I'll do is I'll make this window a little bit smaller. I'll just resize that window to the point where it's about the right size. I want to resize this window as well. So I've got the two windows, one above the other, and then I can see the plot. And then, so that's the plot there. And you can see that chirp. You can see they're spaced out quite far apart over here. And they get closer and closer together here. And we can probably tighten that just a little bit. So let's go say start equals 248001, whatever it is. And then we'll take, pick a start value. S to S plus 4999, see 5,000 points. That's too little. Let's see. So there's 20,000 points. I think we can hear that pretty clearly. And then I'll go plot. So you can see that right there. You can see that pattern there. And as we narrow that range down more and more, we can kind of identify the part of it that has the chirp in it. Okay, so now I'm just going to resize this window. And I want to look at, uh, change the shape of the plot window a little bit. So I've got my a plot window here I can recognize and see things in. Now what I want to do is use TF. TF is a short little script that I wrote back in 1990. And this is computes the sliding window Fourier transform time frequency. Let me close that window and go back to this one. I just got larger font here. 
It's hard to see the help file. You want know, most of those help files I wrote were for 80 characters wide, but I've got a larger font, so it's a little bit easier to see here. Um, so now let's go A, some matrix A, or say E equals TF of E. That's the time frequency. And you'll see it'll just give me a two-dimensional array. Uh, and it tries to figure out the optimum size of the array. And then if we try to display the array, the array E is, is an array of complex valued quantities. So if we try to uh, display E, it's, you know, a complex valued. So uh, one thing we can do is look at the magnitude of E. And it's hard to see, of course, very much there. So what I tend to want to do is look at it on a log scale log of this plus some small number epsilon. Um, and now we can see, you know, the time frequency analysis roughly. And we can kind of see, depending on what we set epsilon to be, like if I set that to be 1 instead of epsilon, it'll, it'll look pretty similar. Set it to be 100. And you can see it takes away detail in the dark areas of the image. Um, and so you, you, depending on what you want that epsilon value to be. And so now uh, EC, let's make, let's say uh, um, size of E, E is about 1944. Um, so midway is 1944 over 2. So let's say the midway, the zero axis, positive frequencies are up here and negative frequencies are down here. And there's uh, it's a real valued signal, so the eigenfunctions of an emission operator are real. You know, if we, something's real, uh, you're going to have, <coughs> there's a, it's kind of irrelevant to look at the negative frequencies unless we had a complex valued signal to start with. So now, uh, let's say E, C is the crop value, is E of, uh, let's say, 1 to 972 or I'll just say 1944 over 2 on a log scale here. Now we just, we're just looking at the non-negative part of it. And you can see it, it, it chirps up and down and all over the place. And you can see this banding here, banding structure due to the fact that there's, harmo you know, that there's a lot of harmonics because the ECG signal is quite uh, high, you know, uh, has a lot of high frequency content, a lot of harmonics. It's almost like a stream of direct delta measures, which will almost have this sort of um, Dirac Coleman frequency space. So it reaches way out into the high frequencies. And now uh, we can also sort of take a look at, at part of it. Uh, so I can say I can split it up even more. Um, and if I say, OK, it's 972, let's just look at the, the inner part of it. Now we're kind of magnifying it up and looking into the, into the part of it. And you can see here that you can definitely see the structure of it where there's a, a, an initial up chirp right here. Right at this point, you can see it shoots up and then it stays high, pretty high here. <clears throat> and then there's the swim and then coming back, it's a lot lower coming back. So the most uninteresting part here is kind of near the beginning when we have laying down and then getting up and running. So the first little bit of it there is is perhaps where it's it's quite interesting. So if we take that uh, signal and look at the first part of it. So recall this part of it, the start part. So the part that has most of the chirp in it is roughly these 4,000 points here has most of the chirpiness in it, CLF, and then plot, plot ES. And then you can see it right here. You can see that there's quite a bit of this this chirpiness going on here. You can see in these you know, 23, just over 20 heartbeats. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 heartbeats there. It chirps from a fairly low frequency up to almost twice that frequency. So there's a lot of chirpiness in that, in just that short little record. The short little chirp there, it's sort of hard to hear it. We can hear that. It might almost make sense just to slow that down a little bit. Might make sense to slow that down just a hair. Um, 
me comment this out and take this and make it something like you know 5,000 samples per second or something and then you can hear it there and you can hear that 5,000 samples start slow and speeds up okay so most of the interesting data from the chirp point of view is kind of in these 4,000 samples here yeah what a beautiful day the sun is setting soon. So now if we look at this data here, I'll say S of, I'm just, I've picked about 10,000 points or so where you can see the, let's clear off some of the dust off the screen here. It's almost beautiful the way the sun glints off the dust. It's beautiful. It reminds me of, so now we've, we, let's say we take those we take about 10,000 points of that sample. Now E equals TF of ES and size of E is 141 square. So we can specify, we can override the default sizes and make it a little bit bigger. Let's make it say 2,000 high by 1,000 across so that when we plot the, when we look at the positive frequency half of it we got about a thousand by a thousand so so let's go uh, c of log of abs of e plus some small epsilon say one and you can see the pattern there now let's just look at the positive half of it say one to a thousand so that's just looking at the positive half of it maybe take it from 500 to a thousand just zooming in close to the origin there just a little bit maybe even more seven say 750 to a thousand so that's kind of four to one now you can see the pattern there you can see it's very nice the way it's chirping you can see the chirping pattern there it's quite quite beautiful to see you can see it's definitely got a chirping characteristic to it now there's some DC offset in the in that signal so if we subtract the mean we can probably get see it a little bit better and then uh, let's just display that again and you can see it a little bit better there if we subtract the mean off of it the pattern shows up a little bit more clearly so you can see that chirping pattern there If we come in a little bit closer to, uh, there's about maybe 4,000 points right near where the center of the chirp is. If we come in a little bit closer to the 4,000 points or so right centered where the chirp is, you can see we're kind of looking in closer to where the actual chirp signal is present. And now, let's, let's subtract the DC offset. Well, first, if we just look at, at the pattern as it is, um, we'll do the same thing and then look at this and we'll zoom way in you know about uh, 100 pixels and you can see it kind of there if I go if I subtract the DC offset and do the same thing again and look at it. it's a little bit clearer a little easier to see you can see pattern here there's definitely this sort of sloping up it starts at low frequencies at this end and higher frequencies at this end you can see all the harmonics are increasing in frequency so the fundamentals right chirping up and of course all the harmonics are chirping with it so they're all kind of uh, you know, going like this as you go progressively so that whatever frequency this is you know this is twice three times four times five times the same thing twice three times four times five times at this end so these are all 
kind of like straight lines that approximately and so they're approximately fitting to what a Q triplet would give you. Even though the days are getting longer we're almost running out of sunlight here so maybe I'll uh, go up to the upper roof. I go up to the top roof. So yeah, let's go up and enjoy that nice sunset. Beautiful. So with the Fourier transform, we know we can use short time Fourier transform to analyze different kinds of signals. So this is a radar, a Doppler radar return from an iceberg fragment sort of bobbing up and down. And these iceberg fragments are big enough to damage ships, but they're too small to show up in conventional radar. And that's where we use the triplet transform to be able to see things that were invisible by other means. So it really saved a lot of, of uh, collisions with these small iceberg fragments. And this is a typical iceberg fragment floating up and down. And it bobs up and down with the waves, so its Doppler shift is kind of a warble. You know, so it almost looks sinusoidal in time frequency plane because the frequency shifts like it's rising and falling in pitch. And so that simply means it's 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 going up and down actually in a circular motion. As the waves bob up and down, this iceberg fragment sort of swishes around in a circle almost, and so its Doppler shift is cyclic or periodic, and this is how the time frequency uh, a sliding window Fourier transform comes up. And uh, now when we start to analyze it with chirplets, a chirplet is, 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 is this form, you know, e to the 2 pi i a t plus b t plus c, c t squared. And so it's got this quadratic in, in, in time in the exponential. And that's, and then we take the inner product of each of these chirplets with the signal under test. And so that gives us the the kind of um, response. And we can use that Doppler. We use that often in wearables to see things. This is uh, here we have the time frequency planes of various situations. This is a wearable computer with a backwards facing radar set that picks up, you know, just at rest, there's clutter. And then there's a car taking off at rest, uh, walking, we're, we're sort of walking away got negative frequencies there when you're walking away. Uh, walking away, negative frequency from the ground, ground clutter in a rear-facing radar. If there's a car hazard coming towards you, it looks like this. A pickpocket, there's a sudden movement towards you and then away. So we sim simulated kind of a pickpocket condition where somebody jumps up to you, grabs your wallet out of your back pocket and runs away. And that's what this pattern looks like. And then a stabbing motion. We didn't actually stab somebody, but we pretended to stab somebody. And so a person runs up behind you and you get this Doppler shift and then the knife comes forward and you get a higher Doppler shift. So we can kind of recognize using machine learning these various activities like a car hazard, a car that's about to hit you, or a pickpocket, or someone who's about to stab you. So that, that those were kind of examples that we used with the chirplet transform. And you can see the chirplet signatures are unique here. These are the, the chirplet transforms of each of those conditions in terms of the beginning frequency and ending frequency of the frequency frequency plane. And you can read more about that in the textbook. And so when we look at a typical signal from radar, for example, we've got, you know, the real and the imaginary radar is a complex signal. And the spectrogram here is very hard to see sometimes certain things, whereas the chirplet transform, we can see these immediate patterns in the signal that are otherwise <clears throat> maybe so weak that you can't see them by Fourier analysis. So we have here the, the radar clutter. This is the pickpocket signature, chirplet transform of the pickpocket. And then we also calibrated the radar using Kolesky factorization. And this is all in the textbook, these simple examples of using radar system with the chirplet transform. And what we have, you know, in a sense, is we've got this transform that that is, is uh, 
able to understand and capture, you know, the, the, the signal of interest. So if we have, you know, a Fourier transform, you know, you're going to have something, you know, the integral of, of um, e to the 2 pi i times time times frequency times some signal, you know, say g of t dt, and that will take us into the frequency domain. You know, it's going to give us a, a, a signal of frequency. And when, when you have, you know, you know, e to the 2 pi i times, let's say, some carrier frequency, fc specific frequency times time, that's, uh, you know, that's equal to you know, cos 2 pi times the carrier frequency times time plus i times sine 2 pi times the carrier frequency times time, where, where i here is equal to the square root of minus 1. And so what we have is we've got this, the real part is the cosine and the imaginary part is the sine, and the magnitude is the square root of the sum of the squares of the real part and imaginary part, and the phase is the arctangent of the imaginary divided by the real. And so this is very familiar subject matter in, in electrical engineering where we look at at Fourier theory and we try to do a, we, we look at it as a kind of, a, of an inner product. And you can think of it, you know, if you think of it kind of as a matrix multiplication, you know, you've got your Fourier transform, you can think of it as, you know, you've got the DC component here, and then you've got, you know, one cycle of a sine wave, and then you've got two cycles of a sine wave and a cos wave, real part and imaginary part. Real part is the cos wave, imaginary part is the sine wave. And then, you know, three cycles, four cycles, and so on, and each of these is a higher and higher frequency. And we're kind of multiplying by the signal that we have here. If the signal was a vector, whatever your signal was, it might be an electrocardiogram signal, whatever it is. I've just kind of drawn it sideways here, and we've got this matrix multiply, and where the first row of this matrix is just the the uh, uh, all ones, so it's just the average of that signal, and that the DC component then is you know here in frequency, and then the next row is one cycle of a sine wave. Uh, inner product of one cycle of a sine wave with this thing, and then you get the next frequency component, then two cycles of a sine wave, next frequency component, three cycles of a sine wave, and so on. And so that's kind of what the Fourier transform in a sense does, is it, it's an inner product of, of, the, of the signal with a bunch of, of, of sine waves, and we, we might, might often write it like this, you know, is, is this... Uh, you know, your signal, uh, your, your transform uh, of, of something, some waveform of, of t times your function g of t, and this is just one, and then you've got a whole bunch of these, and you're taking an inner product with each of these, these waveforms. And so instead of having them be sines and cosines, necessarily what the chirplet transform does is it says that these can be chirps. So we can have a series of chirps. You might have a special case of a chirp is just a sine wave. A sine wave is a special case of a chirp. Even DC is a special case of a sine wave. A constant number is a special case of a sine wave where the frequency equals zero. Another special case is just a constant frequency. Another special case is, you know, you, you can have up chirps and down chirps. So some of these chirps in this sort of, as we call, a dictionary of all possible chirps. Some of them will be up chirps, and some of them will be down chirps. And so you have every possible chirp within a certain parameterized space taking the inner product, you know, of this with the signal under test that we're trying to test to produce, you know, some result in the output. And the way we parameterize that space is kind of really where the the devil's in the details there. So if we take a typical parameterization that we often look at as beginning frequency and ending frequency. So f begin and, you know, over here f sub end, let's say frequency of beginning and frequency of end. And so uh, we may have negative frequencies of interest. Now if the signal's complex, 
we're interested in the positive and negative frequencies, but if it's not complex, we can't tell the difference between positive and negative frequencies, so we might only look at this one quadrant. More generally, of course, the triplet transform frequency frequency plane will have zero at the origin. And if the starting frequency of the chirp is negative, possibly, and the ending frequency were over here, and if the, the ending frequency is negative, we're over here. So if it starts at negative frequencies and ends at negative frequencies, for example, we're over here, and we're right along the diagonal when the beginning frequency equals the ending frequency, and that's the Fourier transform. So the frequency-frequency plane of the triplet transform, you know, ff dot m is the uh, script that I wrote that computes this, and so if we're in this frequency-frequency plane, the diagonal is the Fourier transform. It's a slice through the through the triplet transform. And of course the origin is the is the origin of the triplet transform, which is just the DC offset, the average. And we might compute, you know, I remember I went EG equals EG minus mean of EG just to zero out the mean or remove the DC component. Um, DC offset because sometimes the DC offset will swamp this thing and make a huge peak at the origin and make it hard to see everything else. So a lot of times I like to just get rid of that uh, that um, origin, just blow away the origin, you know. So many times I, I take the DC offset out. And now we're looking at the ECG, the electrocardiogram, unlike the radar signals. You see the radar signals are complex, which is useful because then you can tell the difference between whether something's coming towards you and going away from you. You can tell the difference between positive and negative frequencies, which kind of means, you know, whether you're going clockwise or counterclockwise around the argand plane. If this is your real axis and this is your imaginary axis and when you can tell the difference between positive and negative frequencies you're going clockwise or counterclockwise on the argand plane and that's in certain situations with certain kinds of signals such as radar that's often different useful you can tell whether an object's coming towards the radar or away from the radar if the radar has a complex valued uh, output and so that's that's quite useful in the case of the electrocardiogram it's a real valued signal so we only really need to consider uh, the, in terms of the frequency spectrum, we only need to consider positive frequencies. So we can kind of get rid of the negative frequencies and not consider them. Uh, in case of the triplet transform, it's in quadrants. So we only need to consider this quadrant here and we can get rid of these other two quadrants and not bother uh, with them. So uh, here we have uh, beginning frequency, ending frequency. Now, if we had a steady tone, it would fall somewhere on this line here. So it's going to be the Fourier transform. So if you had a low pitch note, it would give you a strong return here. If you had a high pitch note, it would give you a strong return over here somewhere. So you'd have, if you had a really low note, maybe it would be strong energy here. And if you had a higher note, it would give you a strong peak up here somewhere. This is a three-dimensional thing. The frequency-frequency plane has a height or a value, so it's going to be a three-dimensional context. And so that, that kind of gives you a general insight of what this frequency-frequency plane of the triplet transform is going to give you. Now, if you, have, if, it, if you have something that starts out at a low frequency, say it starts out at zero hertz, and it goes up to a high frequency, so if it starts out low, the starting frequency is going to be going to be zero on this axis. And then if it goes to a high frequency at the end, it's going to be here. So you have a strong peak here if you've got an up chirp that actually starts at zero. So uh, more generally, up chirps are going to appear in this in this uh, octant. I'll call this an octant because this is a quadrant, this whole thing. A negative frequency, so negative, negative, positive, negative, and negative, positive frequencies. But if we're only looking at positive frequencies, i.e. we have a real valued signal, then we're in this quadrant of the chirplet transform frequency, frequency plane. And if we're looking at up chirps, then we're in this octant over here. And if we're looking at down chirps, then we're in this octant over here. So now uh, an up chirp that that starts at zero hertz and goes to some some positive frequency is going to be right on this line here. And likewise, a, um, uh, if the starting frequency is, is some high frequency and then it, it ends at zero, it's going to be on this line here. So these are up chirps here, like and then down chirps, 
bar over here. And if the down trip goes all the way down to zero at the end of the time window, it's going to be here. And we're considering F begin is the frequency at the beginning of the time window that we're considering, and F end is the frequency at the end of the time window that we're considering. So it's very simple to think of that in terms of of octants and, the, and and how it carves up the space on the triplet transform. So when you compute the triplet transform of this electrocardiogram, for example, you'll be able to see, uh, you know, generally where that signal is. And so I hope that uh, that that's fun, and I hope you enjoy doing this uh, assignment or lab or hackathon or whatever you want to call it. Thank you. Get a little windy. Time to call it a day.